Greetings, welcome to Learn or Burn Studios. In a follow-up to my last video, which was on an, the first option on how to burn out ceramic shell, a number of you have requested that I give a little bit more kind of detail on my burnout kiln itself. I know I kind of glazed over some different aspects of it, um, so I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into, you know, my thought, my thinking, and why I designed my burnout kiln the way I did. You know, the kiln itself, i.e. the burnout kiln, is the, its main use or its main goal, main purpose, whatever you want to approach it, is that it's to get the wax out of the, out of the investment, in this case, ceramic shell. So what we need out of that kiln is to be able to, you know, attack that shell as rapidly as possible with a high heat to be able to help flush that material out. Originally, I wanted this kiln to be, you know, it needed to be lightweight. I was taking it on the road um, to different uh, workshops, visiting artist gigs, uh, conferences, that kind of thing. But also my original studio, when I built this thing, I was on the third floor of a warehouse. And, and to pour, I had to hump all my gear, furnace and, and burnout kind of like, down to the loading dock to actually you know, set up, pour, you know, burn out, pour, and then get everything back upstairs before I ended my day. That in itself uh, forced me to make my kiln out of K-wool or silica, uh, silica wool, silica blankets. Um, as opposed to a soft brick or a hard brick situation. Okay, so you know, right from the get-go, I knew I was going to make it out of K wool to keep it lightweight. Then the next thing that comes into play is, you know, what size kiln do you make? You know, the, the instinct is, you know, bigger the better, the more shells you can jam into it. Um, and as I mentioned in the last video, I found that whenever I if I put too many shells into a kiln, wherever the kilns are, or the shells are leaning up against each other, it creates cool spots. And I found that inherently wherever my cracks were in my shells were a lot of times were where the shells were touching. So in the end, I, I decided to design my kiln in such a way that I would burn out my waxes one at a time. And so my, shell ch my uh, overall chamber is roughly about 21 inches in diameter and about 20 inches tall, which also corresponds roughly to the size slurry tank I have. So you know, whatever fits in my tank will fit on my drying racks, will fit in my kiln. And so it's, it ultimately winds up being, you know, so I keep all my shells roughly in this weight. And also that, that impacts me physically a lot less. I've been doing this a long time. I've beat the crap out of myself, um, wrenched out my shoulders and whatnot. So I need to keep things in a manageable size so you know, I'm just not killing myself. Now ultimately, <laughs> if you're younger and you can afford, you know, handle to have a bigger kiln and deal with bigger shells, go for it. Um, but in my situation, I found that for the most part, you know, a shell like this is, you know, going to be, you know, hold maybe... 30 pounds of metal to 50 pounds of metal. That was the justification for, you know, why I'm going to make it out of cable, and then as opposed, and then of course the given size. Now the one thing, you know, while we're touching on refractories for a moment, you know, the idea with the silica blankets is that, like I said, as soon as heat hits them, that heat's reflecting, and so as long as you're cranking in enough BTUs into your your kiln chamber, you're going to get, you know, you know, you're going to raise the heat of that that volume pretty quickly because that heat, you know generating pretty quickly. The downside, as soon as you open, turn the burner off and open the door, you're gonna lose a good chunk of your heat. A silica blanket, you get you know, one inch wool or inch and a half, you're gonna get immediate reflectivity. Uh, with soft brick and, and or any uh, kind of more rigid refractory, it's gonna be about heat absorption or saturation until you actually get that reflective, reflective heat. And so with soft brick, you're typically looking at about four and a half inches in thickness before that heat saturates through and, and reflex. Um, with hard brick, it's nine inches before you, you know, that'll need to be fully saturated before that heat reflects. And that's why you see, like in ceramics, why you see bisque kilns predominantly out of hard brick, because by the time your kiln actually heats up and starts to reflect heat, you know, which might take, you know, realistically, you know, several hours, if not overnight, that in that time frame, it's going to thoroughly uh, dry out your ceramic your bisque ware pots, so you're not blowing stuff up. Now, the one thing you might come across is that, you know, say, well, okay, well, how about with soft brick? You have four and a half inches, but if you look at most electric kilns, the wall thickness is only about three inches. But the reason why you can get away with that, that thickness on an electric kiln is you're not waiting for that, that heat to actually reflect and come back out because your heat source is already in the walls itself and the heat is actually reflecting from the elements directly as opposed to actually having to bounce off whatever your refractory layer is. And then finally, um, with your furnace design, 
uh, for, for actually melting metal if you're using a castable. You want to have, I, I believe for a heavy refractory, it's actually like a five inch wall, but you'll see a lot of hybrid furnaces where people will use more like two to three you know, inches of, of hard refractory and then maybe a layer of blanket on the outside of that um, to help keep down the, the, you know, the, the massive size of the kiln and also allow it to fire up a little bit faster than just you know, heat saturating you know, five inches of refractory around, around your crucible. But uh, uh, that's neither here nor there because for the moment we're going to talk about the burnout kiln. But it's good to know what your different refractories are and what your different choices are um, as you're moving forward and as you're designing your own kiln. Okay, we've talked about refractory. Let's jump into the actual different components of the kiln and the different functionality of each design choice. Now, initially, obviously, to get into the kiln, we need a door, right? And so, you know, typically when we think of a door, it has a couple of hinges. Um, well, it, it, you know, a door, you know, it could be a couple of different things. We can, you know, have a panel that we lift off and set to the side, but that gets cumbersome because we're trying to retain our heat. We don't want to, you know, we want to get the door open. We want to get the door closed. We can, you know, have a traditional door in the sense that we have two, two or three hinges on, coming down one, one side or one rib of the door. And so the door is going to just, you know, open up on that hinge side. But if we do that and have the door just open simply like this, then you know, we're potentially losing heat. But more one of the challenges is that it's like if we have all the weight on the hinges on the one side, because of the heat um, exchange and, and, um, or the heat, uh, the heat inflection of the, of the kiln going up and down in temperature pretty rapidly, ultimately we're dealing with a steel frame. And so it's going to want to expand and contract and you'll wind up with a lot of extra stress on those outside hinges. So the way I've designed actually this door is technically the initial pivot points are out here on this outside edge, but then I have a bridge down here at the top and the bottom and my other, my, I actually have a second pivot point in the center of the door. And this benefits and it really you know, winds up balancing the door a little bit better, but it gives us a, a several characteristics that can really benefit you. I originally saw this design of door on uh, Raku kilns back when I was in college. And those kilns at the time actually were completely out of brick. And so the, even the doors were aligned with brick. So they made them really heavy and cumbersome. So one aspect of that is like you'd open up a door and you would have this heat face, this hot face of the door just blasting you. Um, so that was always a problem. And then, but also, you know, just dealing with the, the overall weight of the door itself. So by putting the, a, an extra pivot point here in the middle of the door, one, it balanced it a little bit better and took and eliminated some of the stress that was happening off the back corner or the back edge. And so it was just a lot easier to open. But the other thing is that as you open it, instead of it just immediately opening up and facing you, and unfortunately I have to admit it's kind of cumbersome, you know, it doesn't quite work as well because of the, the frame I put up here as a, for the roof to protect the kiln. Um, but I can actually open the door and keep the heat f hot face of the door facing away from me. And so I can you know, get in here, either open it just a little bit to kind of see what's going on here, manipulate the shells if I need to. But meanwhile, the hot face of the door is always facing away from me. You know, we can see this volume and like I said, it is ultimately K-wool. Um, I have put several layers of, of rigidizer, you know, just basically uh, coating it with raw silica colloidal um, several times over the years uh, to help uh, trap or encapsulate the silica fibers so they're not just blowing around every time I throw up, um, every time I turn on the burner. If you don't have any rigidizer or, or some sort of sealant on your wool, just the internal pressure, you know, you're, you're pushing in, you know, all this volume of hot gases through your burner into that volume and it's actually going to saturate because ultimately the silica blanket's uh, porous. And so as it pushes through, it's actually going to be launching airborne silica particles out exterior surfaces of your kiln. You can uh, mitigate some of that if you have a, a, a solid skin, like if you make it, use a 55-gallon drum to make your kiln. In my, my case, because I wanted this thing to be portable, I actually used expanded metal to help cut down on some of that weight, but then also that made it you know, more readily that I was going to be pushing fiber back out into my atmosphere. So then I use a rigidizer to actually you know, solidify the wool a little bit more and to help to keep those silica par particles a little bit more trapped and so it was less of an issue. As a, uh, as a backup on that, whenever I'm using this kiln, I am wearing a, a, a respirator with, with a minimum of a, 
um, a P100 uh, cartridge to help pr uh, protect myself from those fibers. But that's actually just one of the risks you run with in running a, a K-Wool kiln, um, and one of the advantages of running something more with either soft brick or hard brick, just because you don't have that silica, um, the amount of silica floating out in the air. To hold in the K-Wool, I've used a series of ceramic buttons that literally look <laughs> like buttons, and then using a nichrome wire that's threaded to the outside and twisted as a way to hold in the, 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 the actual blankets. If you just use wire um, by itself, it will ultimately pull through the blanket just because it's more like cotton candy. There's really not that much density uh, in these type of blankets. So your best option is to disperse that compression over a, a larger surface, i.e. the buttons, um, as a way to maintain these things together. Now this is uh, basically just a I think a basic stoneware clay that I uh, wedged in a bunch of extra grog into it to make it a little bit more porous so it can handle the thermal shock a little bit more thoroughly um, and a little more consistently. And then um, did an initial bisque fire on them, applied them in here, and most of these buttons, especially the darker ones on the back wall, had been there for 15 years. Uh, but the ceramic buttons to hold in the K-wool uh, is a nice effective trick. The base of the kiln itself um, is, a, is a castable or a rammable uh, refractory. And it could easily have been a flat slab, but in this situation, what I would decide to do, again, because I was gonna be, uh, I've moved this kiln around a lot, um, being on the road and doing gigs and whatnot, um, I wanted something that wasn't gonna break down. And so I wanted to have something that I, I would create a, a reasonably decent seal uh, between the kiln top itself um, and the base, which I'd be moving separately. Um, I actually made this kind of more like a donut, so the outer side of the kiln actually sits over it, giving me a nice seal so I don't have a heat leak um, down across the bottom. The other advantage, or the second advantage, I should say, um, of the refractory here is I was able to make it more of a bowl form. So as the wax is draining down through here, everything gets captured and directed to the center of the kiln and falls out in one specific spot as opposed to just randomly coming down and, you know, multiple locations. That way I can also keep it so it consistently uh, falls onto, consistently uh, lands and, and gets captured by the trough um, on the underside of the kiln. Third advantage of having the refractory down here is it actually does act as a heat sink. So again, one of our premises about the burnout kiln is that one, I needed to generate heat as much as possible, but specifically I want that heat focused on the cup and um, the spruce system as quickly as possible. Um, to get those out of the way so there's room for the pattern wax to escape the shell. And so I have my burnout, or the, the actual burner, I'm just running one burner on this thing, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but it's coming out here, hitting the cup, and then ultimately, and then with the heat sink of the uh, refractory, and you'll, you'll, I'm sure you've noticed in the, uh, in the previous video, as soon as I set the ceramic shell into the surface, or into the kiln, uh, just the heat alone from the refractory was enough to start making the wax melt and ignite. Now, if I have a larger mold, there are times I'll do this without the, without a, the stainless rack that I typically put in here. Um, so just so I have a little bit of, a few extra inches of height, but typically I do prefer to have um, a, a steel rack in here. Now I do make mine out of stainless steel. So the rack I've made is out of stainless steel and it's just scraps. It's like going so, you know, it's basically 20 inches in diameter and I'm not gonna worry about having a 20 inch ring so you can see like there's one piece here, one here, one here. It's just scabbed out of just random drops I have, mostly out of 10 gauge stainless, uh, 304. And that's just, and it's not that that's any uh, specific need for this type of kiln. It's just what I had around in the studio. Now, if you're, if you're buying uh, stainless steel specifically for your kilns and, and, and or your burnout kiln, you actually want to get 421 stainless. And that, my understanding is that stainless is rated for uh, heat applications. Um, so that's, that'll be the type of stainless that's typically used on sto commercial stoves um, and vent hoods and whatnot around anything that's going to have direct uh, contact with uh, flame and, and uh, heat sources. To keep these things from bending and sagging under the heat, my rungs with the plate up on end, and then with an extra support rib down here on the bottom. 
just to help keep that you know, from sag. And this rack uh, will typically, it, it depends on how much I'm casting in any one year, uh, but typically I, I, I remake this rack probably about every other year. And so it'll just sit, sit in here on, on top of that donut of the refractory. And this gives me a nice even surface for me to balance my individual shells in here. And so again, have the surface area, the burner comes right, right in here at this level. I get some nice reflectivity off the castable. And because it's a circular kiln and the burner's coming in on an angle, I get a nice kind of vortex effect that spins the flame evenly around the shell to give me that even heat saturation that really facilitates the, the wax obviously melting evenly and, and forcing it to evacuate the shell as quickly as possible. Okay, so the trough on the bottom is actually pretty straightforward. I originally started off with just a piece of angle iron, and even though I had that hole right in the center of the kiln, with the wax just dropping down even just, it's only really dropping a foot or so, 14 inches before it hits the, the trough, it was still, with just a little bit of wind breeze, I was getting too much splatter and too much of it was actually missing the three inch angle iron. So I went ahead and put these additional kind of wings uh, to give myself a little bit more, a larger target area that allows the wax to hit and kind of flow towards the middle. And then ultimately created just a little bit of a lip down here at the bottom to keep the wax and again, flowing it towards the, the middle. Uh, so it will have a nice smooth uh, uh, travel down the trough um, and into my baking pans uh, where I'm capturing the wax. The burner I'm using is what I affectionately just refer to as a Home Depot special. It's all black pipe. Um, ideally, if I can find black pipe, I use black pipe. If it's galvanized, uh, then I'll soak it in muriatic acid uh, to burn off that galvanizing so I'm not burning off. So it's, I'm burning it off in a controlled uh, environment. I'm just not off gassing uh, zinc oxide, uh, which ultimately is poisonous. My gas intake is here. And then I have a quarter inch pipe that you know makes a 90 here, but then I actually makes another 90 in here. And so the quarter inch pipe is facing down the main barrel and I have a pipe cap that I have my orifice drilled into. Come through this reducer and I just have a set screw in here. This burner will actually run uh, just through the natural draw, kind of like a, you know, a normal Venturi burner, um, but I do actually use a, a a, a small squirrel cage on these things for forced air. And then I have a reducer reverse flare, which actually I found that I like to actually uh, take a, another nipple, threaded nipple in here, chase into it and fold into it to actually create a little bit more of a nozzle and then set that in. And it just creates even just a little bit more, a higher level of turbulence around this orifice and keeps my ignition point right here at the mouth of the burner. Um, and really keeps any risk of the flame traveling back down into the mixing tube um, and igniting back here at the orifice. Now, as far as the ultimate dynamics of the burner, you want to, you know, you have, I have my, my orifice roughly about here. I have 12 inches of mixing tube um, to get that gas and the oxygen to thoroughly mix and then come up and with the ignition point being uh, captured on the retention tip. Now, as far as an elbow, ideally, if you're just doing a straight Venturi burner, you want to avoid elbows for the most part. Um, but because, because, again, because of the longer size of my burner, but also more importantly, because I'm using a forced air, I can get away with the constriction of having an elbow. Um, and it just keeps uh, my footprint for my kiln a little bit smaller um, and tighter against the kiln as opposed to having my burner sticking uh, straight out. Okay, so the orientation of the burners is pretty straightforward. The main chamber is run off just a single burner, and it's the same style of burner as what I just showed you that I'm using for the afterburner. Um, it has a little bit larger uh, reducer, just to kind of help spread that flame out, um, a little more surface area as it projects into the kiln. Squirrel cages I'm using are Dayton, I think they're 60 F, uh, cubic feet a, a minute uh, blowers. The nice thing about these is that they also have um, shutters on the, on the intakes of the blowers themselves so I can adjust, regulate the, the airflow directly from here as opposed to having an extra ball valve or, 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 or something uh, so I can um, control the carburation, the mixture of the, my gas and air, my ratios. So one burner for the main chamber, second burner is ultimately for the afterburner. 
Now what I mean for, you know, I, I'm using that term afterburner, and what I mean by that is that, so for a long time what I did is I didn't have this extra chamber at the top. I would be, you know, jam all my, you know, my heat into the furnace. As I melted all the wax out, you know, as the wax is melting, it actually becomes a fuel in itself. And so it really makes a, a, a fuel rich atmosphere in which, and it throws the kiln into a heavy, heavy reduction. And on top of the fact that we're actually burning petroleum wax, that's throwing even more carbon into that atmosphere, you wind up actually generating a column of black uh, sooted smoke off the top of your furnace. And depending on where you are, it basically makes you look like your, your house or your studio or garage is on fire. And so, uh, Again, unless your neighbors know exactly what's going on, it's really easy to find yourself in a situation where you got sirens coming up the street because someone called in that your house is on fire. And you'll say I've had that happen a variety of times over the years. Um, so typically what I would do to kind of get around that, you know, whatever had a studio, sometimes my studios are in industrial areas, sometimes they're in kind of butting up against residential neighborhoods. And even now in my studio, I'm right in the midst of a, in an industrial strip, but I still have guard uh, security stations and guard stations around that I you know, either have to go out and inform to tell them that if you see black smoke coming off that corner of the building, that's just me, it's not the building on fire. And then of course it's a little extra rigmarole in dealing with uh, the fire department, fire marshals as they roll up onto your, onto your situation. Um, so anyway, to kind of get around that, I would burn, a lot of times I would spend most of my time burning out at night to help kind of camouflage that situation. Uh, where I am now, there's so much ambient light off the security lights of the, my neighboring buildings is that my back space here is, is never really actually in the dark. Um, and so I've really had to kind of step it up. And so it's forced me to do um, a recent add-on to this kiln um, referred to as an afterburner. And so let me show you what that entails. As the, that carbonized smoke is coming out of the top of the kiln, I want it to actually pass through another heated chamber or through another burner um, to help actually scrub out that carbon. Now realistically, there's still a, a fair bit of, it doesn't actually clean the smoke. You still have a, a bunch of nasty gases going off into the atmosphere, unfortunately, uh, but at least it knocks down the, that, like I said, that carbonized smoke and so you're not, it's not as visible um, and you're not throwing up as much evidence as that you're doing what you're doing. So the way this chamber is working is that the center section transition tube is my flue initially coming out of the top of the furnace. And then I have a, a box at the top, which is roughly uh, about two feet long, uh, 12 inches in, you know, 12 inches by 12 inches, um, high and wide and then it's lined with one inches of one inch of wool i have just a simple one one port in the back of it as this chamber heats up the burner comes in and it's passing right over that flue and really that's the bulk of what's actually kind of scrubbing through that that mixture or, or that sitted flame and then ultimately it adds into an extra combustion chamber here before going up the final flue to the top and so this is all lined with wool. I have wool through here. And actually that first 18 inches of the flue is also lined in wool um, before getting out into just a, a regular stainless uh, tube. Okay, so that's the basic rundown of my kiln. This is, you know, I've been tweaking this kiln over, you know, many years. I originally built it 15 years ago and it's, I burned out, you know, thousands of shells in it. It works well for what I need it to do. Um, I'm continually tweaking it, you know, whether it's, you know, the afterburner, which is the recent addition to it, to hopefully maybe changing the, um, the, the area, um, to see if I can create a, a, a baffle to create a little bit less fire uh, as it drains out of the kiln, as much as it looks cool, watching the wax drain out, see if I can up my uh, wax uh, reclaim uh, percentage and whatnot. Um, but for those of you that you asked, that's the kind of the basic, you know, fundamentals of the kiln. Um, I'm happy to ask or answer any questions that I might have uh, missed. But, you know, I think we, you know, covered, you know, the bulk of, you know, what makes my kiln for what it is. Now, in upcoming videos, I'm going to do, you know, the, uh, the video before this was talking about the, you know, this option of burning out ceramic shell in a typical kiln. Um, but ultimately, I'm going to show two more options on how to burn out. Um, as well. So 
um, partly if you don't want to generate any smoke and have uh, high wax re reclaim and ultimately maybe even a way you can do it without any kilns at all. So stay tuned for those videos. So with that, thank you for joining me. Subscribe to my channel if you're digging my content and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. And then until then, be creative and be safe.